stayed the night in the poor quarter of the city with Amram and his family. The next day when he returned to court, he knew something was wrong. The princess was waiting for him. You must go at once, she said. My father, Pharaoh, knows about the guard. In, in, in this matter, I can't protect you. He cannot make exceptions, and he has no love for you, as I have. You have changed my life, she said. And I feel that you will do the same for others. She wasn't far wrong. But let us not go too fast. Let us change the scene and let a little time go by. And now we are far from Egypt. In the country of Midian, a small village, the home of the village priest, a man called Jethro. He was sitting outside his house and waiting for his seven daughters to come home. They looked after his flock for him. A flock of sheep, not people. He looked after that lot. He was a bit worried, for the girls had used the pasture that day where the water was scarce, and the other shepherds all men and rather rough. The last time they had gone there, the girls had been treated very rudely and made to wait till last. Jethro dozed a little and suddenly woke in the middle of a great chatter and excitement. His daughters were all round him and all talking at once. Yes, they said, they, 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 they were back earlier than expected and had gone to the new place and the shepherds had been rude. In fact, they had told them all to go somewhere else and, and use bad language. One of them, said Zipporah, the prettiest of the girls, even tried to lay his hands upon me and then was picked up and talked to by this man. Uh, 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 picked up? Talked to? said Jethro. Uh, what man? And all keep quiet except Zipporah. This man, she said, he seemed to appear from nowhere. He was dressed like an Egyptian. He stepped between us, held the shepherd's arms tight to his sides, and just lifted him about six inches off the ground. This brought their eyes level, and then the Egyptian, without temper, talked to him. The other shepherds did nothing. They were afraid. And then the Egyptian gave them back their friend, and he and they watered the flock for us. And here we are. Jethro looked at his rather flushed daughter. Uh, anything else? He said. Yes, said Zipporah. He is the handsomest man I ever saw, and his eyes are brown, and his name is Moses, and he's coming to supper. And Moses did. Jethro, although proud of his fine bevy of daughters, was very pleased to have another man at his table, and so indeed were the girls. They chattered and told the adventure ten times over, till Moses, who was rather a modest, quiet man, got rather pink. Jethro shooed his daughters off to bed, and he and Moses went out and sat in the garden. Jethro had met very few Egyptians, but felt that this one was far from typical. Yeah, and he was right. Moses told him how he had fled from Egypt and the rest of his remarkable story. Jethro, he finished, in Egypt today, it is no life to be Hebrew. Until a few months ago, I did not know I was. I lived at court and closed my eyes to what was going on. Now my eyes are open and I've killed a man for what I saw. And I'm a fugitive. Both men sat still and quiet for a while. Then Jethro made up his mind. Uh, live with us, he said. Be my son. Then he remembered how Zipporah had looked at Moses during supper. Or oh, son-in-law, he said. No fool, Jethro. And that's how it worked out. Moses and Zipporah were married and soon had a son and then another. Moses was happy. He liked his wise old father-in-law and his six sisters-in-law. He lived simply. He looked after Jethro's sheep and enjoyed being a shepherd. Often he would go far afield and be away for days. Solitude didn't bother him. On one of these trips, he came to a place called Mount Horeb. As the sheep climbed, Moses followed them. Soon he was high above the plain. Suddenly, he saw an amazing sight. Not a vision, a real thing, but unbelievable. It was a bush, burning fiercely, with a roaring sound. 
Nothing near to it was alight, and it was not the time of the year for bushfires. But the fantastic thing was that the bush itself stood in the flames unharmed, not a branch or a leaf changed in any way. Moses remembered suddenly that this mountain was called by people the mountain of God. As this thought came into his mind, so equally clearly, he heard a voice. It spoke from the middle of the flames. It said a rather odd thing. It said, take off your shoes. And then when Moses just stared, it said, take off your shoes. This place is holy. Moses did so and began to have a pretty good idea who was speaking. He was right. This is God, said the voice. Now don't be afraid. If you must cover your head with your coat, leave it loose. We have to have a talk and I don't want you to miss anything. You needn't stand so stiff. Sit on that rock. Moses sat down, trembling. The bush burned. Comfortable, said God. A good. Now, listen, I've decided to do something about bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. Many years ago, when I renamed Jacob, your ancestor, by the way, and called him Israel, I promised him that his 12 sons would be a great nation and that I would give them a fine land to live in. One of the sons, Joseph, did well and brought his brothers to Egypt. Very pleasant for them in those days. They multiplied and have become a great many people. But Egypt was not the land I had in mind. Also, these last few pharaohs have got worse and worse, and the children of Israel are having a bad time. I uh, come from Egypt, said Moses. I know that, said God. And you're going back to Egypt. I want you to go and talk to Pharaoh for me. I don't want to make excuses, said Moses, but some years ago I killed a man in Egypt. He was one of Pharaoh's slave masters, and I lost my temper. He was ill-treating an old man. Pharaoh said I was to be killed, so I left. I'll go back if you say, but Pharaoh may remember. I don't think so, said God. He's been dead for some years. There's a new one, even worse. The worst yet. I tell you, said God, even with my help, you're going to have a hard time. Moses said, I don't want to question your judgment, Lord, but are you sure I'm the best choice. I'm not a very good speaker. In fact, when I'm nervous, I stammer. I've noticed that, said God. So I fix that your brother Aaron will go with you. Well, Moses felt a bit comforted by this, and pleased too, for he'd not seen or heard of his brother since he'd fled from Egypt. He sat quiet, and he realized that his life was going to be very different from now on. God kept quiet too and then asked Moses what he was worried about now. Well, said Moses, it's this. If I go to Pharaoh and ask him to free the slaves and tell him the request comes from God who sent it from the middle of a burning bush halfway up a mountain, he's liable to either laugh or to get very cross. Shouldn't I have a note or something? Good point, said God, not a note. No, that wouldn't impress them either. Very fond of a bit of magic, the Egyptians are. All right, then, said God. That shepherd's crook you hold, throw it down on the ground. You've finished being a shepherd. You work for me now. Moses threw down the staff, and as it hit the ground, it turned into a snake. Moses jumped. He hated snakes. Uh, keep calm, said God. Take it by the tail. And as Moses did, it turned back into his staff. Right, said God, that's sign number one. Now put your hand inside your coat and keep it there while you count ten. When you take it out, it will be the white, scaly hand of a leper. Uh, Moses did, yeah, and it was. Put the hand back, said God, and count ten again, and the hand will come out perfectly healed. Moses did so, and when he saw his own hand back again, he said, thank God, and then felt a bit silly. God chuckled and said, oh, it's perfectly all right. Uh, that's number two. Oh, one more. River water into blood. Very effective illusion indeed. You may not need it. Now go home and pack. You can take your wife and children. Uh, get some rest, said God, for you and I have some interesting times coming. We start on Monday. Well, 
we are back again in Egypt, back in Goshen. Outside a sort of small meeting hall sat two men, rather depressed. One was Moses and the other was Aaron. I didn't even get a chance to show Pharaoh the magic God gave me, said Moses. Never seen a man in such a temper. He said he'd never heard of my God and how dare I interfere with all his building work and brick production. What happened then, said Aaron. Well, then he got really nasty, said Moses, and accused me of spreading lies and said that the people must have too much time on their hands. So from then on, the brickmakers would have to find their own straw, but that any decline in output would be punished, and he's cut down the food and increased the hours per week. When was this, said Aaron. About five days ago, said Moses, and since then the elders of the people have been to see me and told me off for interfering. They say I've just made things worse, and they're right too. I feel I've done it all wrong. God knows what I should do now. If God knows, said Aaron, perhaps we ought to ask him. So they sat and waited till God spoke, and when he did, Moses told him all about it. Well, cheer up, said God. I told you this job wasn't going to be easy. Oh, go and see Pharaoh again. This time, no matter how rude he gets, you do the magic. Don't do all three tricks, just the first and last. Oh, see how it goes. Well, Moses and Aaron did as God said. They asked for an appointment and rather, to their surprise, got one. The last time, Moses had been thrown out. When they were shown in, Aaron looked around. A fantastic place. He'd heard of the magnificence of the court from Moses, who knew it from his boyhood. But nevertheless, he was amazed and depressed by it too. For everything he saw suggested absolute power and wealth. Every face he looked into was hard and cruel, and many were sneering too. Aaron could see their point. Here were two poorly dressed Hebrews in among all this grandeur, and calmly asking for freedom from slavery for a whole people. Aaron and Moses stood together before the great throne. Hundreds of people seemed to be present, and no pharaoh. Courtiers, servants, soldiers, priests, officials, and many strangely dressed men with tall staffs of office, each one different. They are the court sorcerers and magicians said Moses nervously. I think that we are to be made sport of. Oh, bow your head, Aaron, he said. Here comes Pharaoh. Well, there were great crashings of gongs and blasts on trumpets and music and rose petals thrown about, and it all took about 20 minutes. But at last, Pharaoh was safely sitting on his throne. There was a silence. Speak, said Pharaoh. Aaron prepared to speak for Moses if his brother Stammer got too bad, but Moses seemed all right. I don't want to make you cross again, said Moses to the king, but my God said I was to show you a sort of a miracle sign as a sort of credential. Carry on, said Pharaoh. Moses took his shepherd's crook and threw it down on the floor. For one horrible moment he thought it wasn't going to work, and then the staff turned into a wicked-looking snake. 